I am recording. I'm sharing my screen. And uh, welcome to get started with Open Refine, Explore Clean, and Transform Your Data. I think in the workshop description, I called it uh, Data Wrangling with Open Refine. So, uh, same thing. <laughs> um, this is a really fun uh, workshop. I use Refine for all sorts of use cases. It's a really interesting tool that really flexible, really powerful, and um, nice to use. So I'm always excited to teach it. And I think there's a lot of uh, applications in all kinds of different fields. I'm obviously in uh, the library field. Librarians are uh, very into using Refine for all sorts of metadata purposes. Um, there's also a lot of use in um, biology with all kinds of um, data wrangling tasks and all kinds of fields where you need to take some data maybe from sensors or from your experiments and transform it in different ways before you start you know, doing your final analysis. You can also just use it for exploring the data. So we're going to take a look uh, at all of that. Um, and we're just going to get a quick overview of Refine, look at the data that it can work with and kind of um, some thoughts about that. I'm going to show you kind of how to get started with everything. And then we'll go through kind of a demo of the basic features to hopefully um, let you have a really good idea of kind of how it works and what it looks like, how it might work for your particular use case. So um, get started. Uh, we'll, there's the, all the, the sections here. Um, we'll just click on Refine. Um, and this is our introduction. So what exactly is OpenRefine? It's a free uh, open source standalone Java application for exploring, cleaning, and transforming data. And it runs offline in your web browser. So the interface is something that looks like a website. It's not a website. It's just something that's running offline on your uh, local machine. Um, and I highlighted free here. Uh, this is a free and open source software. It's not just free as in it doesn't cost anything, but it's also free uh, as in open source and you have um, rights to use it in particular ways. So if you're not familiar with that, um, go ahead and uh, check out that link to learn more. Um, I think it's an important concept. So the original creator of OpenRefine, it started out its life as um, free base grid works or something like that. And uh, this person, David uh, Hugh, um, was original creator and then he was hired by Google. And so for a long period of time, it was known as Google Refine and then Google um, open sourced it and it became its own community project. So now it's known as Open Refine. So um, the original creator says that Refine is a power tool for working with messy data. And it's been a kind of uh, description that is stuck with it and people continue to use that. And he said, it's more powerful than a spreadsheet. It's more interactive and visual than scripting. It's more provisional, exploratory, experimental, and playful than a database. Uh, I kind of like this. Um, little introduction, uh, because it's it's pretty true. Um, if you work with spreadsheets, you know that there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. Uh, but the the views that you have on your spreadsheet are kind of limited, you're going to see something very different with how refine represents the data and lets you interact with it. Um, I use Python pandas and a lot of people use R and data frames, things like that. Uh, but this is a much more visual sort of exploratory uh, experiment experience than having to write out um, your script in Python and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, it's more iterative and you get previews of what's going to happen. And so I really like it for something that I'm exploring versus if I know that there's a certain set of known um, transformations that are going to, that I'm going to do, then, you know, it makes sense to write that in Python. If it's something where I need to explore the data a bit more first, um, Refine is a much better tool. Uh, in my mind. Uh, and then, you know, working with a database is never all that much fun. So Refine is a lot more fun than just messing around with the database. So it's going to look something like this. Uh, there's an interface um, inside of your web browser, and we're going to get to that in just a bit. So uh, it works with tabular data, pretty similar to like a spreadsheet, but the interaction with that data is very different and it's it's quite unique so rather than kind of on refine or on google sheets or um, uh, excel where you really are looking at the rows and the individual columns and editing them refine's not good at that you can't just sit there and do data entry tasks with refine um, it's good um, where you're doing major transformations up and down columns across your data set harvesting um, information from the web or from some other um, data and combining it with your data. Uh, so 
it's not for data entry, uh, but it's really flexible, very powerful for doing all kinds of data wrangling, where you're going to change the formats and bring in new data or clean up um, all of the existing values. Um, and so it's really, I would think, I try to describe it as column centric. So most of the operations look up and down these columns, and each of the columns has got a menu on the top, which give you the tasks um, to that you can apply uh, to those columns. Um, so what kind of things might we use it for? Uh, one of the really good use cases is exploring your data. So you get this data set from some repository or that you created five years ago and you forgot what you were doing. You want to open it up and you want to get an idea of what is in that data uh, because and what kind of errors are in that data. Uh, because before you start doing a bunch of transformations, you really want to know what it's like, what's the characteristics of it, um, what is the quality of it, and there's a lot of um, tools inside of Refine to help you dig into that data and really get to know it um, before you start messing around with it. Uh, and then cleaning the data is the main use case. Um, it's really efficient at um, discovering and fixing all kinds of inconsistencies and just mass transforming um, chunks of your data where you have values that are incorrect or um, just need to get cleaned up in different ways or standardized and normalized so that you can do better analysis going forward. Um, enriching data, it's very good at combining files, merging projects together, um, fetching information from the web and bringing it into your table, um, and reconciliation with various online reconciliation services. So that's another really good use case. And that was kind of the original um, purpose of uh, Refine. Uh, transforming your data, it's very flexible at importing different types of data and exporting those. And so that's a very handy um, uh, tool. Just sometimes if you have a CSV and you need to get it into JSON, this is a really um, flexible and visual way to do it. But also internally, you can split up the columns, transpose the columns and rows, um, split and join multi-valued cells, make subsets of your data. Um, that's very powerful as well. And then finally, to automate your routine. A lot of times, if you're going to automate your data processing, it's going to be a script in Python or R. Um, but in some cases, your routine can't be 100% automated. And so one of the nice things on Refine is that you can um, export your entire routine, um, which shows you exactly what you've done with that data, how you've changed it, um, and what operations you've applied to it. And so that's kind of a nice um, aspect for transparency. Uh, but you can also then reapply those same transformations to a new data set. So if you've done, if you're, if you're, um, you know, you're getting sensor data on a regular basis, or you get uh, description data from somebody, um, you know, once a month, and you have to do the same thing to it every month. If it's exactly the same every time, maybe that's a Python routine. But if you have to do most of the same things, but then you know, have a little bit of human uh, intervention at a certain couple points, uh, Refine is really good at that sort of thing because you can apply those. Uh, transformations, do a couple of little things visually and manually to check out what's going on and then maybe apply some more operations and export it. So automation um, in a kind of unique and flexible way. Um, so uh, let's take a look at what sort of data um, they're talking about when we're talking about a power tool for messy data. Uh, so one of the really big strengths here is that you can handle all kinds of different input and um, sources and data sources uh, when you're getting started with it. So um, and I have it kind of divided into these three areas. So you can import all kinds of different formats. So you have CSVs, TSVs. You can have any kind of customs separator. Uh, CSV and um, TSV are very common uh, interchange formats because they're a plain text format where it's a tabular data uh, in CSVs. Uh, separated by a comma and TSV separated by a tab. Um, but you can also just set up your own um, separator that's anything that you want. Uh, it can import Excel files. Um, it can uh, import um, open document uh, spreadsheets. So like uh, from LibreOffice, um, XML, JSON, RDF, you can import um, Google Sheets. Uh, Mark is a library world format or just uh, various line-based text and, and more, more uh, formats beyond that. Um, you can get those uh, formats from all kinds of different places as well. So you can get it off your local machine, which is the most likely. Um, sometimes you could actually have, um, but you can also open more than one file at once, which can be very handy. Sometimes you know your sensors or your um, uh, would give you a whole pile of uh, 
35 CSVs, but really you want them all to be together, you can just open them as a batch with Refine so that it's just easily to merge them all together. Um, maybe you get transferred a set of files over and over again. You can put those all together, just open it as a batch. It can also just directly open it from a zip archive. Um, it can uh, open it off the web. So if somebody's putting that data up um, at a URL that you can reach on the web uh, to grab it from the web and bring it down to your local machine, um, you can just put in that URL, that link. Um, you can paste in things from your clipboard, which is a surprisingly useful um, approach. Uh, you can connect directly to a database or you can connect directly to uh, Google Sheets um, if that's helpful. So uh, once you've done all your work with your data, you can actually um, output it in all kinds of uh, really flexible formats as well. So it's just immediately can give you TSVs, CSVs, HTML tables, Excel files, um, open document files. Um, you can export it um, to a database, so SQL commands. You can export it in Wikidata format. Um, you can set up an RDF uh, schema for some linked open data kind of approach. Um, or you can just create custom templates that will let you export pretty much anything that you can imagine um, that's iterating over your rows and exporting it into a, a plain text file. So um, this uh, flexibility here is really a, a great feature that lets you do a lot with a lot of different types of files that you want to work with. Um, the other thing is that really important to know about it uh, when you are importing that data, when you're creating a new project, it does that without changing or touching that original source. Um, this is something that uh, is frustrating if you're working with Excel. Um, Excel, when you open a plain text file, actually starts writing onto it immediately, which can actually totally corrupt that file. So you have a CSV that has a bunch of um, Japanese characters in it, and you open it with Excel those will end up being corrupted and you won't be able to directly recover it, which can be an incredibly frustrating um, experience. Uh, you can, and so it's going to import that data without changing anything. It's copying it into its own kind of optimized internal format. And then it puts it into a um, workspace directory on your computer. It's just a folder somewhere in your computer where it has all of your projects. Um, and the important thing to keep in mind there is again, um, it's not a cloud-based service. It's not sending any of your data off of your machine somewhere during that process. And uh, there's kind of some links here to give you some more um, information about uh, exactly how that works. Uh, but again, this is going to be a, a tool that runs inside your browser, but it is not a website. It's not some um, uh, service that's going off of your computer. Um, so it's worth uh, just keeping that in mind. Um, <clears throat> So once it's actually imported into your project, um, the interface is going to represent that data in a pretty typical tabular grid, um, as you might see in Excel or Sheets or anything else. And it uses the terminology um, like this. So you have these individual values, which it calls cells. You have these columns, which it calls columns. And then you have rows across, which it calls rows. So just to keep that straight, uh, since different fields will call uh, the, these terms in a slightly different language. And it's very efficient um, for up to about 100,000 rows or beyond hundreds of thousands of rows. If you have really huge data sets, you might need to um, increase your memory allocation. And so there's some instructions there and it's pretty easy to do. So what is this messy data that it's good at uh, transforming? Um, Basically, you know, any kind of inconsistent formats of your values, unnecessary white space, uh, extra characters, typos, incomplete records. If you have messy data, you can't really do your analysis effectively and you can't reuse your data in different ways. So uh, what is it good at fixing? I have these kind of example columns here where we have um, all the same date in different formats. So uh, this is kind of an ISO standard date. This is kind of what we do in America. This is a kind of visual writing out the date. Uh, and then this is, does anybody know what that number is? This is uh, the internal format, um, the 1900 style date that Excel uses. So it's the number of days since 1900. Uh, and the interesting part on that is that Excel has, there's a bug in it where it's uh, incorrectly considered some years as leap years. And so this isn't even the right number of days, but they never fixed it because that would break too many people's tables. So uh, this is a lot of times you'll see your, your, 
your um, sheets corrupted with these weird numbers in your date column, and it's usually coming out of Excel's uh, um, 1900 state format. These are all the same um, value uh, with different kinds of qualifiers on it. Uh, and again, like to a human being, it's easy for us to look at those and see what the errors are. We know that this all relates to $1,000 in different ways, but when you're trying to put this into your uh, machine to read this and do analysis and uh, add things up, these are all 100% different values and they cannot um, be reconciled by, by the machine. And here I have the different versions of using Idaho following a variety of standards and maybe some uh, spelling errors. And so again, we want to find all of the values that contain Idaho, but these are all uh, obviously Idaho to a human being, but not to a computer. The other thing that you're going to encounter a lot that Refine is good at fixing is multi-valued cells. And so I'm kind of uh, an example here where we have kind of a citation. And if we want to do some analysis and we want to do some cleaning of this, this big long kind of text value is not very useful uh, for that. So we have really a couple different types of values. We have a title, we have a couple authors, we have a date, maybe a year and a month. Um, and so if we could split those up into separate columns, it'll enable us to do a lot better analysis and, and cleaning of the data. So Refine's good at breaking that sort of thing up. Same here with like a, a address where there's definitely different fields um, that this address is made up of easy for a human being to parse, but if you're trying to transform and work with this data, it's a lot more usable if we can just break that up and make it into separate columns. Um, luckily, Refine gives us all kinds of tools uh, to deal with those uh, kinds of issues and then to really try to discover and isolate and then fix um, all of these data issues. Uh, I just had a note here about Really, there's not a lot of literature out there about wrangling and cleaning data. It's really something that people, everybody has to do. And we all do it behind the scenes. Maybe we have grad students working on it. There's a lot of labor involved. Uh, and um, it's essential to the process of analysis or to the process of creating digital collections in the case of a library or other uh, uh, situations. And um, it's also really important for open data and the open data movement, because if you clean up your data, then it's better for preservation uh, and for reuse uh, for other people. And so this is a really important process that doesn't get enough credit. Um, so make sure that you're documenting what you're doing, being transparent about it, because it's gonna help you remember what was going on while you're working with this data. And um, it's also gonna help others understand uh, your data set and shed light on all that important work that's gone into um, preparing this data uh, for use and reuse. So, um, you know, put it out there so that people understand what's going on. So uh, any questions about the kind of general background about Refine before we move on to uh, running running it and, and doing something with it? Yeah, a quick question. If you want a specific format, does the software know um, that that's the format you want? Like, you know, for Excel, you if you want a specific format, you can, um, you can click on uh click on the like a box on the right within the cell to 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 let it know that that's what you want do you know what i mean i don't know yeah so you, are you talking about when you're exporting it or are you talking about the cell type um like number text date is that what you're talking about yeah like for example if i want a specific date format yeah so there's going to be all kinds of ways to, to work on that and so i'll show you that when we go into the demo in a Thank little bit you. um and so, yeah, there's there's cell types, just like you have in a normal spreadsheet. Um, and then when you want to start transforming it into different kind of output formats, uh, there's lots of different tools for that. So we'll, we'll get to that in the demo a little bit, I think. Okay. We'll answer your Thank question. You. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so before um, we start using it, I just have some instructions here about how to get it installed. It's not a traditional application where you're just gonna click this installer and install it on your machine. It's actually just a folder of files. That's a bunch of Java, um, which is a programming language. And if you read a lot of documentation out there that it says you have to install Java first, that's no longer necessary. And so that's a step that you don't need to deal with and makes things a little bit simpler. Um, no longer necessary on Windows and Mac. Uh, so there's some official documentation out here, but uh, this is just the instructions that you can get um, here on my on my site. So you can you just basically are going to download a package. So I've already downloaded it here. Let's see. 
So here I've got it downloaded. Um, it just comes as a zip folder um, on Windows and um, on Mac, it's gonna be a DMG. And so basically you're just gonna um, unzip this folder. You wanna put it into a, a nice location that you can find. So on this Windows computer, I, um, so I'm gonna, I've downloaded it. I have this zip folder and I'm going to um, unzip that folder. I'm going to go into my Windows C drive and I happen to have this folder that I just call Evans programs. Um, and I just put that folder of files uh, here um, in um, in that folder. So it's just a nice place that's permanent out of the way. You could put it in your documents just somewhere where you know where it is and you're not going to like delete it. Um, and then once you get in there, um, you're going to see that it is just this folder of files that you can uh, um, work with. Um, so uh, download the package on Windows. You're going to choose the Windows kit with embedded Java, which is the one that you don't have to install in Java. Um, it's already there in this package. On Mac, uh, the, you're just going to download the one that's called Mac kit. And on Linux, there's one that's just called the Linux kit. On Linux, you do have to install um, Java first, um, and that should be pretty easy using repositories. Um, once you get that package downloaded, your kit, like I said, you just extract it, try to put it into a sensible um, permanent location. And then once you've extracted it, you're going to start um, Refine by uh, clicking the various files. So on Windows, you're just going to have this folder of files, and you look inside of there, and there's going to be a executable. So it says openrefine.exe. And that's the executable that's going to start up this program so that you can use it. So if I just double click on that, um, it's going to start up this window that you see here. This is a terminal window. And um, we're going to let that run. And then you can see that it started up now a browser tab here with OpenRefine running in it. So um, once I do that on Windows, I go ahead and pin, um, there's going to have a little uh, Refine logo on your uh, menu bar, or your taskbar. I go ahead and just pin it to my taskbar so it's really easy to restart um, when I want to do that. Um, so this window that you have here is the Java application running um, in a terminal. And uh, you don't have to interact with this at all. This is just, uh, this is where the application is actually running. And it's essentially running this application. And then it's running a little server, a local web server, just for your machine um, that hosts this little website um, that, or a pseudo website that is the OpenRefine interface on your machine. And so once this starts up, you can't shut this because that will tr turn off the application. Um, you can minimize it. You can um, put it somewhere else. You, you don't need to look at this in any way. Uh, and so once this starts up, uh, you can just kind of put it away so that you don't have to look at that anymore. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to reiterate that. There's two parts. There's this terminal window. Um, how you start it is going to depend on your operating system, um, Mac and Windows and um, Linux each have a slightly different way of starting it, uh, which is listed up above here. And then you're going to end up with one of these terminal windows. You can ignore that. Uh, and then the interface is going to be this uh, website here in your um, browser. And if you close it, um, you can always get back to it by following this link or using localhost 3333 in your address bar of your browser. Uh, because even if you close this um, tab, uh, it's still running here um, in this uh, uh, terminal. Um, when you want to shut down Refine, um, all you have to do is you just close your browser window. And then you go back to your terminal. And you're going to just do a control C. And that's going to safely um, shut it down. So make sure that everything is get saved. Um, and before it uh, turns off the application. Um, you can just go and X out of here, but you risk that it hasn't saved everything. So it's trying to auto save your projects on a regular basis, um, but just to make to be safe on the, on the safe side, uh, just doing a control C is uh, the best way to get it shut down um, safely. Um, okay, and so I mentioned that here. And then I'm just gonna reiterate one more time um, that, uh, even though this user interface is rendered in your web browser, 
I got to start my refine back up again. Um, it is not a web application. It uses the terminology of um, upload and download, uh, but it is not uploading and downloading any information. You don't need an internet connection to be using it. Um, and finally, uh, importantly, use Firefox, Chrome, or Chromium uh, browsers. Uh, most of the other browsers, especially Internet Explorer, um, will not work properly or have a pretty good chance of not working properly. OK. So um, we're going to start uh, working with Refine a little bit. And um, to get started, I think I'm just, I have some sample data here. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to use this Potlatch Historical Collections data, um, which is some digital collection metadata from the University of Idaho Library. And I've kind of put some extra errors in it and things like that. So if you just click on that CSV, um, you should get it um, downloaded on your machine. And let me see what I've got here. So I've got it downloaded here on my machine. Um, so the first thing we got to look at is this new OpenRefine homepage that's opened up uh, when we started up the application. And you can see, uh, you know, here's the title of what we're working with here. And there's on this far left side, there's these four kind of tabs. There's create project, open project, import project, and then some settings and preferences down here. Um, create project is where we're going to create a new project. So we'll get that get to that in one second. But I just wanted to quickly show these other um, tabs, what we won't be using today. But open project is all of the projects that you ever create on Refine will end up getting stored in your uh, working directory. And so they're all there for you to reopen at any point. And so if you go to this open project, obviously I've used Refine quite a bit. And um, so I have all these projects that I can just reopen. Um, and just clicking on that, I get to the state where I was uh, last time I used it, and I can just start working with it there. If I click this button, hold on. Um, so that's the open project. Um, it's nice that you have uh, all of these um, projects kind of managed for you here so that you you can always go back to where you were and it's always auto saving that project um, on a regular basis so that all of the data you don't have to press control s or anything it's just going to be here um, saved up for you import a project i very very rarely use um, import a project as if somebody has exported an open refined project and um, it'll be a zip file usually and they'll save it directly to you or maybe share it to yourself and you can just open that um, whole project. Most of the time I'm going to just go ahead and export the data as a CSV and then use that in my refine project to start the new one. Um, but it is an option. So we're going to work today with this create a project um, tab um, and uh, create a project. So uh, we're in this create a project tab. Then there's another, the next choice that we have here is this get data from. And so this is that, where do we want to um, grab our data? So uh, you can direct, if you have a CSV or some other kind of data source, so JSON or whatever, that is just a link. You can literally just paste the link of the file in on the, from the web. You can paste something in into the clipboard. So we could have like column one, column two, uh, one, Two, and we could actually just start a project like that. Um, sometimes that's really useful uh, if you just are grabbing something off a website or out of a document and just paste it right into here and it'll just work. You can connect to a database. So if you have different types of databases, you just set up the connections um, on your local machine. And so that can be very helpful if, if you have a database where all this information is. Or you can click um, and connect directly to uh, Google Spreadsheets. And so you put in this kind of share URL. Um, you can even sign in uh, with your Google account to um, authorize uh, getting that data. But most of the time, you're just going to use this first option, which is get data from this computer. And so that means open a file locally. Uh, so we're going to click Browse. I'm going to go into my downloads. And I have this Potlatch historical data collection or historical collection.csv. So that's a CSV file. Um, again, if I just double click that on Windows, it's going to open in Excel and it probably is going to get corrupted. Um, but I'm going to say open. And so now I have it here and I click this next button. And it's saying upload data. Again, that's 
really not the correct terminology because it's not uploading the data, it's just copying it into its own format. It's really importing or loading that data. Um, and so once we click next, what we're on to a next screen called uh, configure parsing options. And so this gives you that choice of making sure that uh, Refine understands what this data is and what this file is all about. Um, and that's really important because you want to be able to parse your file correctly. And um, this is another feature that uh, Excel is, is not particularly good at. A lot of times it doesn't really give you those options um, to try to figure out how to parse the data correctly. And it just goes ahead and corrupts your characters or corrupts your dates and things like that instead. Um, so this is a really nice feature that allows you to make sure that you're actually getting that data parsed in the correct manner. And so it makes a guess of what this data is, and it usually is pretty correct. So it knows um, it's guessing that it's a CSV, which is correct. It is a CSV. Um, and it's made a whole bunch of guesses here based on what it what it thinks are, is correct. And um, then it gives you a preview of what it looks like, um, what this data looks like to refine when it's parsing it. Um, and this preview will update as you um, click on these different options um, so that you can kind of get an idea of how it's changing those parsing options. So um, the really important one in a lot of cases is to go ahead and check this character encoding um, for plain text files like TSVs and um, CSVs, they're usually going to be in UTF-8 encoding. And um, so you want to, if you click in this box here next to character encoding, that gives you the options and UTF-8, um, if you know that that is the encoding of your data, which is the case for most um, uh, plain text formats, um, then you can click that UTF-8 to make sure that those characters don't get lost um, in the parsing. Um, you can change the different um, separators. Obviously, in this case, we have a real CSV, so that's correct. Um, there's this option here where, as it's importing it, it's going to automatically trim all the leading and trailing white space from any string that it detects. So if this has a space on the end, it's going to automatically just um, trim that off, because that's a really common way to clean up your data in the first place. So it's already going to run this nice um, data cleaning thing to every column just to get those strings all cleaned up. Um, if you don't want that to happen, you just uncheck it. Um, we're going to leave it checked this time. And let's see, make sure I'm not missing anything here. Um, and so having this preview is nice because you get that visual confirmation that what you're doing um, is changing something and, and you can kind of see if it's working or not. Um, if you wanted to change how it's parsed or what it's guessing um, this is, you can always click on one of these other um, parse as a JSON file. Okay. In this case, it's not going to make any sense because it really is a CSV. Um, so you can always force it to parse it uh, following a different um, method. Uh, and so usually the guess is correct, but occasionally you'll have to force it to parse it in the way that you want it to be parsed. So the CSV is looking pretty good. Um, we can go over here to these other options where sometimes your CSV might have um, some descriptive text at the top that's, that takes up like three lines. So you can actually just go in to this option and say, skip the first three lines. Um, in that case, oh, in this case, we don't have that. Um, it's going to parse, if I have this clicked, it's going to parse the next line as the headers. So you can see these headers are already um, identified as the column names. So if your data does not have headers, you can uncheck that. Sometimes your headers take more than one line, and so you can change um, what it's doing there. Uh, and so there's lots of different options to make sure that what you're getting um, is matches uh, how you actually want it to be parsed, um, which is really a, a great feature. Uh, next thing you want to do, um, if you want to just start with a different file, obviously just click start over to go back um, one page here. Uh, but now uh, we're going to make sure that we have a good project name. It just takes your file name and it removes any periods and things from that. Um, and so I'm just going to take off the CSV at the end. And your project names are a little bit more useful, if uh, easier to work with, if you don't have spaces and weird characters. Um, and so I put underscores in mine. Um, but you want it to be descriptive so that you can remember what you were doing and and uh, and what you're using it for. So I'm just going to add demo on the end of this, uh, just so that I'll know what this project was, and I can just delete it later on. Um, and once everything's looking good, you can go ahead and click this create a project button. 
and it's going to do that final parsing and show up uh, now in our interface. So uh, we have a new project, um, and I'll just kind of show you the uh, interface here. Um, we have our project name up in the corner here on the left. And if you want to change the project name, you just click in that box and you can change it. Uh, over on this side, we have open and export and help. If you click open, it's just going to reopen this um, home page again. So you can start a new project if you want. You can just you can have as many as you want open. It's very efficient. These web pages uh, are only um, it's not spending a whole bunch of CPU trying to figure out how to present this page. It's just a static page once it's um, once you've applied some kind of operation to it. And so it's only really doing some work whenever you're applying an operation. So you can have a whole bunch of tabs open. You can have a whole bunch of projects open, and it's not going to slow anything down or bog down refine in any way. Um, this export we'll get to uh, a little bit later after we work on our um, data. Um, over on the left hand side, you're going to see that there's two panes, uh, and we're going to work a lot with this in just a bit. So we have the facet and filter pane, and we have the undo and redo pane. So this is going to show us everything that we've applied um, to our project once we get it started and allow us to go uh, forward and back um, in that history. And this is going to show us our facets and filters that we've applied to the current view of our data. Um, and then right here, you're going to see a number of rows that are currently showing. And that's a really important number to keep uh, paying attention to because it's kind of your um, coherence check. You should get the same number of rows that you expect that you should have. Uh, so uh, you can always go back and check your original data to make sure that um, nothing's gone wrong while it was parsing it. And I always grab that number and kind of keep it in my head uh, so that I know um, how many, I, I should know how many rows I expect to have. And after I do different um, processes and uh, transformations, I should still have the coherent, correct number of rows uh, through all of that. So it's just a good way to, to keep um, track of what's going on. Um, you're also going to see here that says uh, show as rows or records. Um, there's some information there about the difference between those. So you can go take a look at that. It's not going to come up um, in this demo. Um, and then there's show 5, 10, 25, 50. So that's just showing, you can see that this preview is not your full data. So if you open up a normal spreadsheet, you just have this endless um, piece of data, so which can be very um, bogged down your computer if you have thousands and thousands of rows or tens of thousands of rows or 100,000 rows. So instead of showing you your full data set, um, Refine is only going to show you this preview um, of them, and then it's going to paginate it. So if you have some really big um, data set, you can just turn it down to only five rows at a time, so that it's something that's very easy, easy to look at and doesn't waste a lot of CPU and um, displaying this to you and doesn't get distracting. And then you can use these pagination buttons over here on the right hand side um, to walk through uh, previews and, and go and look at your whole data set and, and get to um, look at what's in there. Um, so uh, and you could just adjust that by clicking these different show um, options. Those are the basic um, interface. And so now our next step is maybe we want to start um, exploring this data and we want to um, use Refine to really you know, dive into what's in here, um, try to surface the different features and characteristics of, uh, of this data set and, and try to understand what's going on. And so um, how that is going to work is a little bit different. Um, all of these uh, column headers have a little arrow and each of them actually will have a, um, a menu on it. And this is where you're going to apply uh, all kinds of different um, facets and filters um, and operations that change the column um, come from this little menu and relate to the column uh, that it is on. And so the first one that we might do is if we click on um, donor here and we go to uh, text filter, if you click that, that's just like a search box essentially. So we're going to filter it by um, just the text. So I can just put in Gary or Gray, Gary. Yeah, so we have Gary um, in this column. If I put in Gary, it's showing that of the total um, 1,700 uh, rows, there's 95 of them that contain the word Gary. Um, and so this is just a very quick way to start uh, looking for things. Let's check in the 
descriptions. I want to know if any of these contain a dog. So I type in dog. Oh, great. We have nine rows that contain dog in the description. Um, so these are ones that I might be interested in, in taking a closer look at. We can also say immediately with, um, and you can see that this, this filter that I've applied shows up over here in this facet and filter um, pane. And so if we can put more than one on, and so um, I could put another text filter on over here and um, I could put in children. Ooh, how about child? There's child. And so now I've applied one filter on description, one filter on keywords. And so with both of those applied, as you and you can see that they're applied because they're active over here on this filter plane, I've got myself down to just two matching rows out of this whole data set um, that contain both of those um, conditions. And the other thing that you can do is um, invert your filters. And so right now, I've got it filtered on description uh, containing dog, and I have nine rows. But maybe what I want is actually all of the rows that don't contain dogs. So I'm going to actually just click invert over here on this filter. And that's just going to do the opposite. So it's removing those nine rows that we have. And so we're left with um, 1,700 rows uh, that don't have dogs uh, in the description. And then if I just want to remove that filter, I can click reset to just go back to not having a filter. And you can also just click this X to get rid of that filter altogether. Um, so that's a text filter. The next one that we might want to use there is uh, facets. And so um, if I click on the donor and I go to facet and I click text facet, um, that's the most common one that you're going to use for exploring uh, strings. And what it does is it just goes down that row counts up all the unique values, and then it shows those in this facet pane here. So um, it's essentially like a unique values count. And that gives you a really interesting and quick view into the whole contents of this data set. So you can imagine if we have um, you know, tens of thousands of rows, you're not going to be able to just scan through it and kind of get a sense of what's in those rows. Uh, but you can very quickly get the unique values out and take a look at them in one of these facet panes. Um, so in this case, I have um, eight different choices um, in unique values in this donor column. And then you can see that each one of these gives me a count so I can see which are the most prevalent. I can sort them by the name um, or I can sort it uh, by the count. So Gary Stong apparently is the uh, most common donor who's donated 95 or yeah, 95 of the items uh, in this particular collection. So let's say I want to look only at the ones that relate to Gary Strong. And so I just click on Gary Strong and it's subsetted down um, that data uh, to the 95 matching rows out of this whole set. Um, so you can very quickly just um, make subsets of your data by clicking on these facets to only include those ones. So I can also add multiple ones of these facets. So if I go over to Ann Davis and I say include, now I've got um, two conditions. It can either be Gary Strong or uh, Davis Ann. So now I have those two um, uh, sets uh, put together. So I have 149 um, matching rows, 95 with Gary Strong, uh, 54 from um, Davis Ann. Uh, and so I can very quickly pull together the set, the subset uh, from um, our whole data um, that I want to work with, that I want to isolate for different reasons. Um, and then you can do the same thing where um, if we select Gary Strong, we can actually just invert that. So we want to have all the donors except for Gary Strong uh, and look at those rows. So again, I've got the opposite of um, the initial uh, sort. Um, another facet that's very useful is to use a, um, if I click on Creator and I go to Facet and I go to Customize Facets and I go down to Facet by Blank, this is a really quick way to just find your blank rows and maybe exclude them. In a lot of cases, you're, you need to exclude your blank values uh, from your data set. And so this is a really quick way to do that, either to find those blank values or to exclude them. So um, this uh, condition is, is the creator field um, blank and uh, false would mean that there is a value. So I'm going to click on false. Now I have um, just the ones 
um, that have an actual crater field filled in. And you're gonna see that there's 21 that have a crater and each one of those, there's just one of the choices in that text facet. So um, I guess Decker W is the most common one. So there's four uh, by that person. And uh, so we can quickly start looking through this data and understanding um, kind of what's there, what's blank, what's not blank. Um, let's take one more look here at a, um, let's see what we got. So there's another um, subset types of facets that you can use um, depending on what kind of data you have. Right now, all of the data that is in this table right now is set up as a, um, as text, as strings. And so the only ones that really function correctly are going to be the text facets. But if you have numeric data, you can set up a numeric facet. Um, timeline, if you have time data and uh, scatter plot is also for numeric data. And then you can come up with a lot of different um, customized facets that just do some of the common ones um, very easily for you. Uh, so we're not going to look at those right this second, but I think we'll do a numeric one um, a little bit later. Uh, the last one in these basic ways, right now we haven't transformed any data, we haven't changed any values, we've just changed our views so that we can kind of get a sense of what is in here. You know, we might look over here at the source and just see, you know, where are all these coming from? Okay, I can see uh, there's all these different ones. Maybe we want to look at uh, what are um, the, the format types here and we go to facet, text facet, and it shows that we have these um, format types. Um, and if we go over here to one other thing that you can do very quickly here is uh, where it says choices. If you click that, it actually will open up um, a window that shows that gives you these choices. So you could reuse these um, if you want to use that somewhere else, uh, which is really a pretty handy way to get the unique values out of um, a column. Um, and actually, I see that I'm using a uh, a older version of this data because I added some more errors in it. So I'm actually gonna um, just walk through importing the project again, just to reiterate that. So if I click this open tab, um, I can start a new project um, and I can get it from this computer, browse, I can choose the data that I wanna use, the CSV, go to next. Um, it gives me the parsing options. I can go over here to, they all look good, go over here, demo two, give it a unique project name and create project. And so just to reiterate how you create a new project and get to it again. So uh, we've explored this um, data set. We um, are getting uh, some idea of what's in there, some of the errors that might exist inside of it. And so now um, let's start editing. Uh, oh, one more thing I wanted to show is sort. I forgot about that, sorry. Uh, the other thing that you can do is sort um, by a value. Uh, by a column or multiple columns. So maybe we want to sort by the title. Um, and so if you click on that title, there's this option here for sort. It gives you the ways that you can apply the sort. Um, in this case, we only have text, so we want to use text. And we want it to be, let's say, Z to A this time. And then we click OK. It's just going to sort the view of our data. So right now, we haven't changed that um, table that's lying underneath. All we did is just change our view of the table. And you're gonna see that the sort is active because it has this little menu here showing up now saying sort. And so you can actually apply multiple sorts from different columns um, to, and they um, they go hierarch hierarchically. And you'll see they all show up here, um, all the ones that are active, kind of similar to this um, filter pane. Um, if we decide that in fact, this sort uh, should be permanent, um, this is how the data should be ordered. We can actually go into the sort menu and there's an option saying reorder the rows permanently. And it's gonna rewrite this as the definitive order um, of this data set. Um, and so uh, in this case, I'm just going to um, remove the sort. So if you click remove sort, it'll go away. And um, now let's start doing some editing of our data. So far, we've just kind of changed the view. Um, We've gone ahead and uh, you know made these subsets. Um, now let's go ahead and start editing it. So uh, the most basic thing you can do is just hover over a cell. You're going to see this little edit button shows up, um, and you can just start editing it. So 
I'm going to click here. It says login camp in Canada. Um, and we can just change that directly by editing it and then apply um, that. So that's a quick way to just edit an individual cell. Um, you can also go over here and let's say we want to edit this one. It says logging Canada camp mules. And let's just add something in there. And you can see that there's an the option here to apply or to apply to all identical cells. So if there's a whole bunch of other values in here um, in the status set that say logging Canada camp mules, um, I can just go here and apply to all identical cells. And if you look up here, it tells you how many cells it's actually transformed. Um, the other way to do this is if we go um, and create a facet. And so let's go take a look at um, this format digital. And I go to facet, text facet. So now I have these four um, types of format digitals that are showing up. And if I take a look at those, I can immediately see that, you know, I really should try to clean this up a little bit. So I have um, application PDF, I have this uh, image JPEG and image JPEG, but they're spelled differently. And then I have JPEG. Um, and so if I want to make all these JPEGs to be the same, I can just edit it here on the facet. So I'm going to put image, and then I'm going to make it image JPEG with an E, and I apply that. And so all of those ones that were named that are now switched um, and then it's refaceted here. So now I have 1,169 that say image JPEG without the E. And I'm going to go here to the facet. I'm going to add the E and apply. And so now we've transformed you know, a couple thousand cells and made them all normalized so that we can do some better analysis because now we have these values that actually were the same actually showing up as the same. Um, we could do the same thing here with language. So if we go in the language column, facet, text facet, we're going to have three different values. We've got EN, ENG, and just English spelled out. Uh, let's say we really want this ENG version. And so we can go here and edit, and we can do um, ENG. And let's see, this EN, we go to here, edit, we add a G in the end. And so that we just transformed a whole, you know, thousand cells and got it all normalized so that we can use this data um, more efficiently. Um, so that's editing a cell, editing um, by facet. Uh, and the next thing that we might want to do is um, actually transform um, values. So uh, we're going to do that. Um, let me go ahead and find something good to transform. Uh, Oh, we'll just look at the title for now. So if we go to title um, and you click on the menu and you go to edit cells, transform, um, we're going to open up this column or this box called the transform box. And it gives you this little window uh, for creating an expression. And these are going to be uh, sort of a little mini programming language that you can apply uh, to transforming your data into different in different ways. And so uh, the options are GREL, which is the general refined expression language. It's a small language. It's pretty easy to learn um, that's specifically for doing transformations in OpenRefine. You can also use Python or Clojure if you um, prefer those languages. Um, and so what we can do is um, all of the information here is actually in the help, but there's a reference uh, linked here that gives you all of the GREL um, transformation information. Um, and there's a lot of little things that you want to do um, that you might want to do. So let's say we just want to add some text to the end of every title. Um, so we're just going to say it's, I want to add text in Idaho to the end of every single title. Um, the value is what's currently in the cell. I'm using plus and then adding this string. And it's showing you, OK, this is what it currently looks like in this preview window. This is what it's going to look like after you apply um, your expression. And so it's very nice to have this preview window here so that you can go ahead and take a look and get an idea of if it's working or not and doing what you expect. Um, the other one that you commonly use is replace. So I'm going to do value dot replace. And so this is kind of, this is a find and replace. And so I want to replace, um, let's say big. So I put uh, value dot replace parentheses, oh, shoot, sorry, uh, parentheses big 
in quotes, and then I'm going to replace big with um, uh, cat. And so now if I look down at my preview, you can see that there is an instance of big right here. And in my preview, it's showing that's going to be replaced by cat. So um, that's going to go through every row. You can see that this row does not contain big. So the output is exactly the same as it was. Uh, and then um, once I'm uh, happy with this uh, application or the, this expression and what it's going to transform, I can just click OK. And it's going to apply that. And it tells you up here how many it actually has applied it to. So in this case, just two um, in, in the whole data set. There's a bunch of these that are automatically set up here. And so if I look in edit cells, common transformations, it's showing you that there's a whole bunch of common ones that are easy to apply um, just from this menu here. And that just applies it for you. Um, so you kind of have a find and replace. You can add a new value. You can get um, data from a different cell and bring it into that current cell. Uh, and then it's very powerful with transforming dates. So uh, here we are in our date column. Let's first take a look here at using the text facet to see if there's any um, issues with our date column. And you can see that there is some. So you can see right now that I have a whole bunch of dates that have these weird uh, curly brackets on them. So maybe first what I want to do is apply a filter. And I'm going to put in curly bracket in my filter. And so there's 24 of these that have a curly bracket in it. I'm going to invert that. So now I have all of the rows that don't have curly brackets on them. And now I'm going to look at these dates again and see if they're looking um, clean. And you're going to see that I have some that are just years and some um, that are kind of this ISO format date. And so what I really want here is my ISO uh, format dates. So I want another text filter on here. And I'm going to, all of these ISO format dates have got a dash in them. So I'm going to put a dash. OK, so now I've got only these ISO format dates, except for some of them only have a month. Um, but that's OK. So now let's say I don't really like these sort of ISO format dates. I want to put it into the American style. So now I'm going to do my transform. So now when I'm doing this transform, it's only going to apply to the stuff that I've currently have viewed. So if we look here, I have only um, 610 rows that I'm currently looking at. I filtered out a whole bunch of other stuff using um, this filter here and this filter here. And so when I um, apply anything now, it's only related to the part that I'm looking at, these 600 rows. So if I go over here to date and I go to transform, I can start using um, transform here on those 600 rows. So I'm going to do a dot for the dot notation to date um, function. So it's going to convert this value from a string value into a date value. And then I want to put it back into a different um, format. So I'm going to do to string. Um, and then I can give it the format that I want to see. So let's say we want to see month, month, day, day, year, year, year. Actually, maybe we'll make these splashes. See how that goes. So um, it's taking this date, and we can take a look and see if it's making sense here. And now our preview, yeah, that looks like what we want. We've transferred from um, this ISO format into kind of the American date format. And then if I click and I took through this um, preview to see if it's all looking like it's working as expected, and it seems like it's pretty good. So I'm going to say, OK. And so now it says it's transformed 610 cells with that little transform that I've added. And you're going to see that now we have zero things showing up in our facet. And that's because we still have these two filters applied, um, where we have uh, we were trying to get down to those ISO dates. And now we have no ISO dates in the set, so we don't have anything to see. So if I remove um, this filter. Now we're going to get back all of these new dates that we just created in this um, American format. And then if we remove this filter, uh, we're getting back to all the full data set. And we still have these weird rows of dates that are strange. We have this new date format. Um, and then we have uh, some years which uh, didn't follow um, the ISO format in the first place. So there we've just done created a subset. 
trying to get down to the ones that we actually want to transform. And then we apply to transform um, to that set. Uh, and that's going to be the kind of very common uh, workflow that you're trying to use to wrangle your data is try to figure out some way to isolate what you want and then some transformation that can fix uh, the problem. Uh, the other tool that we have to be able to do this is um, editing uh, a column. And so I'm going to close this date. Um, we are going to uh, let's create a length field um, off of this title. So if we take a look at the title and we click on the menu and then you go to edit column, there's a whole nother set of um, options here that apply to the column itself. And so um, we can add a column based on this column. And that's gonna be very similar to doing that transform, except that rather than transforming it in place, we're gonna create a whole new column um, with the same data. So uh, I'm gonna add a column based on this column and you have to give the column a new name. So we'll say title, length and we're starting with this expression window once again we start with value so if i just apply this okay what we're going to have is an exact copy of um, that column and so that's very useful because a lot of times you want to keep your original column create a new one do a bunch of transformations on that new one so that you can check back check your work against the original va values to make sure that you're doing what you wanted to do with it. Um, so you can just create a, a copy of that column by using OK at this point. But we can also apply a transformation during um, the creation of uh, this uh, column. So actually, in this case, I'm going to apply a transformation. I'm going to take my value, do this period, dot, um, and then apply a function to that value. And so I have value dot length. Uh, parentheses. And so that's just going to give me the length, the number of characters um, in that string. And you can see the preview, it's transformed um, the string into the number because the number of characters that are inside of this string. And then I'm going to say, okay, so I have this new number um, column, the title length. Uh, and so now maybe I can use that. I can show off my numeric facets now. So if I go to facet, numeric facet, it shows you this kind of range um, inside that title. So some of our titles are very short. Some of our titles are very long. If you you generally have an expectation of what those values should be like. And so maybe we're going to be like, uh, let's try to see what these really long titles are. And um, a lot of times, maybe that's where the problem is going to be. And so we've quickly been able to isolate um, a subset of these saying these are the very long titles. And so let's take a look at those. Um, and you can see, yeah, maybe some of these are wrong because they have a bunch of weird characters inside of them. Um, maybe we want to look at the really short titles. I can use this numeric facet in the other direction to go down and say, give me these very short titles. And maybe I want to use a text facet to look at those. And they're all kind of one word things. Maybe that's an indicator that something is wrong um, with this data that I need to go and update those particular columns because I expect the titles to be more in this middle range um, of actually being something like a sentence. Um, so this is just ways that you can start, again, isolating that subset that you need to work with, um, finding um, the problems in your data and being able to try to fix it and at least figure out where those problems are. Um, the other thing that we can do is uh, use um, uh, one of these columns and use some kind of separator to create multiple columns. And so um, let's just do it here. This isn't necessarily sensible, but um, I'm going to go to this format column and I'm just going to create a new column based on that column. Um, and I'm going to call it uh, format two. And this time I'm just going to create a copy of it. All right, so I've created a copy of it in format two. Now I want to go ahead and um, split that column into two, because now maybe I want to work on the two parts of this value. I want to split out a multi-valued field um, into two different columns. And so in this case, um, I'm going to go ahead and edit column uh, and then split into several columns option, split into several columns. And I need to give the separator. What is the thing that separates these multi-values in this column so I can split them into two different um, values? And so the separator in this case, um, if we look, uh, is the slash. So I can put a slash in there 
And then I can limit it so that it won't split out into like a million columns um, if I don't really know or if I uh, know exactly how many columns I want. So I'm going to say split it into two columns and then I'm going to click OK. And so now I've gone ahead and I've split that format two column into two different columns, format two one and format two two. And so now in these columns, uh, you can see that we've split um, the values that were originally there. And so a lot of times that's a really good way to start working with your, your data um, to be able to like split out um, complicated values that really should be into separate um, columns so that you can work with them in a more efficient and usable manner. Um, we can also uh, use these um, columns once you create them um, to fetch information from the web. And so you can see the, these, these columns right now already have a URL in them. So if I click on them, it'll go um, over to that web page on the live web. Uh, but OpenRefine will actually let you just harvest um, data off the web as well. And so I'm going to create a quick recipe that I happen to know here. And I put it in the outline, just if you can play with it, that I know that with this content DM number, um, I can add a column based on this column. And if I work from that content DM number, um, I can get the I triple F um, or triple I F API and get information about uh, the items. And so I'm going to put in this expression, which is a string, which is kind of a URL um, for this API that I happen to know. I'm going to add the value and then I'm going to add the rest of that API um, information. And then I can say, OK. And this API is only going to work on um, JPEG items. So I can go ahead over to my format here, and I'm going to go to um, the JPEG items. So now I'm down to 1,700. I don't want to actually spend a bunch of time on um, 1,700 items. So maybe I want to add another filter here. And we'll go to cat. Oh, um, dog. OK, so there's just one um, item that has dog in the title. So now I have just one item here. And just to make this a little bit faster, uh, I can go over here to this API column. And I want to fetch add a column by fetching API or fetching URL. And it's going to literally just go out to that website and put it down and put all the information that it gets on that website into a new cell. So I'm going to fetch that. I'm going to say the IIIF info. Um, it's just going to use this link right here to go fetch it. And then this is a delay so that you don't um, make it mad, but I don't need to delay any at all. And I'm going to click OK. And so now it's going over here to grab that information from um, this website here. And you can see that it just went out on the web and it grabbed that JSON from that API. And so now I've got this new information that I can use um, to add uh, and check against um, you know, for the rest of this data. And so that's a really common and really good way to enrich your data, um, to harvest new data about um, something uh, out there on the web. And then um, it's a really cool um, and interesting way to, uh, to work um, with, with Refine as a kind of harvester. Um, Refine also in these transform tools uh, has tools for parsing JSON, parsing XML, and parsing HTML. So you can really do a lot of sort of web harvesting, um, getting data off the web and in JSON and using it to enrich your data or to create your data set in the first place. Um, so I'm going to remove all of these filters that I applied. And um, OK. So I'm going to skip ahead because we're getting uh, running a little bit longer than I wanted to. Um, Multi-valued cells uh, has some tools for working with that. It has a clustering um, option so that you can um, identify and cluster uh, text values into single values, which is very um, useful for string um, and text uh, data. Um, there's an all column over here where you can filter all of the rows based on um, different uh, features. We can also use it to reorder all the columns. So if I want to move this title length down here and I want to delete this date as approximate, I can just very quickly do that, make a major transformation to the whole data set in a very quick and um, easy way. When I'm kind of putting together these facets that I'm trying to get down um, to uh, things that I want to fix, you can 
um, let's say we want to put a filter here on dollar sign in the title and I want to put another filter here dollar sign oops dollar sign in the description and you can see with those two things applied um, I have 18 matching rows so now maybe I want to mark those rows so that I can use them later on so I can go over here to edit rows and I can say flag the rows and it just adds this external column here the flag column um, that we can then use to make further um, subsets in different ways and so then I can facet um, by the flag and so those um, 18 that I flagged are there um, for me to use in setting up more and more complicated subsets of my data that I can work with. The last thing I wanted to point out there is uh, we've started to apply a whole bunch of stuff now and if I go over here to this undo redo tab you can see that I've done 15 things and everything that I've done is listed here um, in this tab. And so if I want to, whatever I just applied, um, I just step back and it undoes it immediately. You don't, you can't lose um, any of these transformations. You can't lose all your data. So if we want to go all the way back to the beginning, it's just a click. I can go back to the middle of what we were doing. I can go back to the end of what we're doing in one click, which is really pretty incredible um, uh, feature to have. And so you want to be able to do these transformations bravely. Don't hesitate to do it. Try it out, see how it works, and see if you're getting what you're expected. If it's not doing what you're expected, if you messed up your data, you have undo redo to get back to where you were. You didn't lose any data. You didn't corrupt your data, um, even though the whole history is saved. And so, um, this is really a great feature that should empower you to um, be brave working with your data. And then the other feature of undo redo tab is you're going to see that these two buttons here extract, which allows you to actually export your entire history as a JSON um, file. So I can take all this JSON here and just paste it into um, a text editor. And then I can reuse this um, on another data set. Um, and apply exactly uh, the same operations or just use it to remember what I did. If I want to apply, I can paste the JSON from another project into here. Um, and if you have exactly the same structure of columns, you can apply all those operations in, uh, in a row using this perform operations and you'll end up with the same results. So um, the values are different, but if you have all the same rows, this is a really great way to automate um, some of your processes. And then the final thing, once we've done a whole bunch of work um, on our data, we've done all this wrangling, we've cleaned it all up, we've been imported new data from the web. Um, now we want to use it uh, somewhere else in some other kind of project, in some sort of analysis. And so uh, we get over here finally to this export button. Um, and you have a whole bunch of different options here. The first one is uh, this open or find project um, to a zip file. Uh, I've never, I never use that. That's if you want to save the entire project and share it out to somebody else. Um, but then you have these basic formats, um, which are common interchange formats. So you have tab, um, CSV is what I um, almost always use as an interchange format. Um, Excel, the old style Excel and the modern Excel, um, if you need to create those um, formats. And then you have some much more um, complicated ones down here. So one of the really interesting ones is templating. Um, if uh, Well, so if I want to export this as a CSV, I just click CSV and it says you're downloading it. So it's created that CSV for me and it's going to show up in my download folder. Um, and when you're using export, um, it's going to export the filtered view that you're looking at right now. So that first one was my whole data set. I just put in a filter here on the title for cat. And so I have 19 rows. If I do an export right now, I'm only going to be exporting those 19 rows into my CSV. And so that's actually a really helpful and quick way to be able to create subsets of your data um, that are, you know, that you need for different purposes. Um, it's a really great way to subset um, your data based on some criteria. Um, some of these, this uh, templating um, allows you to export customized um, JSON. And so if you go in here, um, this is actually using those same um, Grel um, expression language uh, to put the stuff uh, onto um, this template. And it's just going to use, this is a template that you set up that is going to be applied to every single row. 
and then it's going to export that into a plain text file. So you could actually reuse this um, and just create any kind of arbitrary file that you want. So you could actually use this to make Markdown or to make HTML or to make a novel, um, anything that you could export into plain text by iterating over your rows, um, you can use this templating engine to, to do that. So it's kind of an interesting and um, cool uh, advanced feature. But most of the time, you're just going to be using um, CSVs or um, XLSX, uh, depending on what you need to um, get this data into uh, for your other um, use cases going forward. Um, and um, final thing to just reiterate there is it's constantly saving your project. So this project as it is right now is saved. And if I go over to open and I go over to my open project, you can see my two projects that I just created um, in the last hour are here. And if I click into them, um, I just get back into where I was. Everything that I've done um, is saved there uh, and ready to reuse. So once you close Refine, your project doesn't go away. Um, everything that you've done should be saved and um, you can continue to work on it uh, in the future. Um, and that is really uh, what I wanted to try to cover um, in terms of this introduction demo to what's going on with Refine. There's a lot there. I kind of ran through it, but the best way to start using it is, you know, open up Refine and um, play around with some of this data, play around with your own data to figure out how, how it might be useful um, for you. But hopefully this gives you a sense of kind of how it works, um, this kind of strategy of isolating by subsetting your data based on a whole bunch of different criteria, and getting down to the parts that you can edit um, so that you can um, manageably and efficiently fix the er errors in your data and wrangle um, things together. Uh, if you want to have some further resources, there's a user manual that's very um, nicely done. They've just recently released this, it kind of follows the same starting a project, transforming um, your data, transforming your data, um, just kind of exploring your data, transforming data, just the sort of things that I uh, use to structure um, the demo. Um, there's a reference for the Grell um, transformation language. There's some FAQ, there's a Google group where people are pretty active and ask questions. Stack Overflow has a lot of questions on there um, that people answer. So it's a good place to browse for answers to your question. And then there's a whole lot of tutorials um, that are out, available out there. So there's a whole list here and here's some um, that are uh, pretty, um, that, I, that I suggest from Data Carpentry. Uh, there's also uh, some recipes for how to do things. And this is just my own notes um, of handy functions that you might um, be interested in and in using. Um, so go ahead and take a look through those resources and um, hopefully uh, it'll give you somewhere further to go. So uh, that's what I wanted to cover um, for this introduction. And I'm just open to any questions that you might have at this point. Anybody have a particular use case that they're thinking about? In a, in a classic fashion, I just worked with a big data set that had a bunch of references in it in which this would have been just so helpful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I might have to go back to it. Uh, and now that I know that this exists, um, it'll make it, make it so much more pleasant, so. Yes, no, I mean, that's exactly like the best way to learn it is to be like, oh yeah, there was this thing that I was trying to do. <laughs> oh yeah, this is way easier. The other thing I think is important um and useful is a lot of times um excel actually can get in the way of processing some plain text formats and um so this is kind of a good intermediary where you can open a utf8 csv and um not mess it up and then create an excel file using refine do your work in excel that you want to do in your normal workflow and then Excel also doesn't export CSVs correctly. So a lot of times your visualization software wants a CSV or a TSV, Excel never does that correct. So then open the Excel file with Refine and create the CSV correctly um, so that you can use it in your workflows. So that's another good kind of use case that it's kind of an intermediary of transforming um, your data. Uh, so that's another thing to think about too. 
Um, thank you all for uh, showing up today. Here's my little refined terminal. And so to end off my work, I can just close my tabs and I can hop over to my refined terminal here and do a control C. And you can see that it saved, closed, um, never didn't lose any data. And so we're ready um, to work on that project in the future. Uh, feel free to reach out to me um, on email and ask any questions that you run into as you start working with this. And um, I'll try to post the video somewhere and tune in for future workshops and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for showing up.